you very much for Thank everyone. You. Thank you for joining us in this first session of the day. We will now start the keynote lecture. I will pass the word to Professor Michael Wang, who will introduce our invited guest. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a really great pleasure to uh, introduce my old friend, uh, not so old actually, uh, doc Dr. Sarah Tai. Actually, Sarah, we've we've known each other, I think, for about 20 years, although I'm sure you were a teenager when I first met you. Um, uh, we share quite a lot in common, actually. Not only are we both clinical psychologists, but uh, we, um, we're both of uh, mixed ethnic heritage. Um, so we both share, not the same father, I don't think, but we're both uh, half Chinese and half English. Um, uh, so, uh, having just embarrassed Sarah, I'll just uh, actually say what I should say, which is that Sarah is a senior lecturer in clinical psychology at the University of Manchester at the Centre for New Treatments and Understanding in Mental Health. And she's also a consultant clinical psychologist at Greater Manchester Health NHS Foundation Trust. She's an experienced practitioner, therapist, educator, and researcher who works internationally in a range of mental health settings with people experiencing serious and enduring problems affecting their mental health and their families. She has pioneered clinical innovations such as patient-led appointment scheduling and patient perspective care. Sarah conducts research internationally, including large clinical trials in the UK, the USA, Canada, China, and across Europe. Her work elucidates how key psychological mechanisms such as control and awareness across traditional diagnostic boundaries and help unify apparently disparate therapeutic traditions. This work not only helps explain the nature and origin of psychological distress, but offers new therapeutic opportunities. Specifically, she's been developing a cognitive therapy known as the method of levels based on perceptual control theory and is also leading on the development of psilocybin assisted therapy. That's magic mushrooms to you and me, by the way. I'm sure you'd probably like to ask her about that at the end. Um, but um, uh, just to say that, that Sara is part of a, of a British tradition of pioneering uh, psychological uh, applications to psychosis. Um, and and uh, it's, it's uh, just really, I think, really encouraging to see um, psychological approaches as opposed to psychiatric approaches to serious mental problems such as psychosis. Um, so Sara is going to be talking to us on new directions for working with people experiencing psychosis, a focus on principles. Thank you so much, Mike. What a delight to have you introduce me. I do appreciate that. And um, welcome, everybody. It's an absolute pleasure to be able to talk to you today uh, about this area. I'm going to share my screen now so that I can uh, put the slides up. So um, I hope you can see those OK. And as Mike just said, I am going to be talking today, uh, not about the magic mushrooms, actually, but I'm happy to answer questions later on that but about new directions for working with people who experience psychosis, particularly from a point of view of focusing on principles. Now, I'm quite excited. I've got lots to talk to you about, so I'm going to um, not hang about and, and get straight into it. Here's a picture of Manchester University, where I am based, although I haven't been in my office for quite some time now. Um, what I'm going to be covering today is I'll just set the context a little bit by talking briefly about some of the existing approaches and evidence within psychological interventions for psychosis, but then mention some of the challenges that we have with these approaches. And therefore, why I'm suggesting uh, a principles-based framework for understanding psychosis, and also a way of integrating a lot of what is existing evidence so that we can apply that and actually have another therapy uh, or a, a newer way of working with people with psychosis. And I'll talk to you about some of the evidence we've been developing for that. 
What I do want to be clear on, though, is I don't want to talk about the approach today as another new therapy. This is really about looking at the evidence that exists and saying, OK, how can we capitalize on that to really make the most of it, to make sure that what we're doing when we work with people is focusing on what we already know uh, seems to be working well? Um, goodness knows we've got enough new therapies, so I um, <laughs> will talk about the framework underlying it. but very much hope it doesn't come across in a way as though I'm trying to sell yet another new thing. Um, okay, so let's have a look then at some of the existing approaches in psychosis. Um, psychoeducation is quite a common one, but no real significant effects demonstrated yet in meta-analyses. And again, I hope I'm not coming across as saying where a lot of these approaches don't have significant effects, that doesn't mean to say they are not useful and that people don't tell us that they're useful. It's often that there just hasn't been a significant amount of research that's taken place. And that research, uh, which is available, has tended to be maybe a little bit smaller. So I'm, I'm saying the, it, there's not a lot done in this area rather than it doesn't work. So psychoeducation we know has some benefits for some people, but no real significant effects in, in meta-analyses. Then we have training-based approaches, which is uh, an example of a training-based approach is metacognitive training, which is focusing on uh, metacognitive processes such as attention and um, you know, uh, uh, jumping to conclusions, which is common in psychosis. And there have been some small effects for positive symptoms in this area, but nothing really shown in other uh, areas. And again, for social skills training, not a lot found other than for negative symptoms where there have been some quite significant post-therapy effects for that. But what we do know is that those effects tend to be there whilst the training is going on and not necessarily at follow-up once that intervention has stopped. So very useful while it's being done, but less so on its own later. Family interventions, the news is a little bit more optimistic. There have been some really good findings for family interventions. And I think it's really important to mention that uh, quite often we focus on working with individuals and less so including their social support network. Whereas what this research suggests is perhaps we need to do a bit of a rethink on that and really involve uh, close family members and, and loved ones in people's lives where appropriate. Of course, there are many families where people don't get on so well and we, it might make it worse. So it has to be the right environment, but some pretty promising results for family work. Other approaches include humanistic and also psychodynamic approaches. I'm not lumping those together, but just to say that the evidence for those isn't really um, that clear because there hasn't been an awful lot done. And the work that has been done, uh, particularly for humanistic, is almost non-existent, but uh, for psychodynamic, two meta-analyses, only four studies uh, really included where there were no significant effects found. But I know that people like Glenn Gabbard in the um, US are doing some work on psychodynamic approaches for psychosis, and it's looking a little bit more promising. So the jury is out still on, on that one. <laughs> now, of course, you will have heard much more about cognitive behavior therapy and related approaches within psychosis. Let's look at the related approaches first because they all fall under the, the CBT umbrella. Acceptance and commitment therapy, some significant moderate effects for positive but less so for negative symptoms at uh, uh, post-treatment. Not an awful lot done though in comparison to CBT on its own. Uh, some small effects, though, for reducing rehospitalization, And then for mindfulness, again, the same. Uh, moderate to large effect sizes for overall symptomatology and hospitalization. Some small effects on negative symptoms. But really, I think a lot more work needs to be done. And it's interesting because these two particular approaches are much more based on looking at people's individual goals and um, also attention shifting and attention control, which is what I'm going to be talking about in, in my principles-based approach. 
So I find it interesting that the evidence base for these two seems to be a little bit more uh, promising. And then of course we have CBT uh, itself. Um, there have been quite a few meta-analyses since the one conducted by NICE in 2009. There have been a, th a further 13 meta-analyses looking at all different studies of CBT for psychosis. For overall symptoms, there are some small effects at post-treatment and various follow-up periods. Definitely seems to have some benefits over and above treatment as usual, although less clear when we start to compare it to other active control um, conditions. So by that, I mean things like befriending, for example, whereby um, post-treatment, not always a lot of difference shown, although in follow-ups, some slight preference for CBT. For positive symptoms in psychosis, so this is sort of hearing voices or seeing um, things that others don't see, less clear results and mixed results some benefits for CBT um, compared to treatment as usual. And for negative symptoms, to be honest, there have been more non-significant than significant findings in some of the meta-analyses, for example, that by uh, Jauha in 2014. So mixed findings for functioning and rehospitalization as well. So basically, um, NICE currently are recommending second generation neuroleptics psychosocial support and psychological interventions, which are pretty much CBT, even though the evidence is quite mixed, but definitely better than treatment as usual. Uh, so that's what guidelines are certainly suggesting at the moment. And for CBT, it tends to be a process of assessment, followed by formulating in terms of identifying key thoughts and behaviors that may maintain symptoms. And intervention tends to be focusing directly on these symptoms and trying to help people cope with them better or actually reduce things like hearing voices and, and negative symptoms. So it includes a whole range of techniques that are really based at helping people identify thoughts that might be unhelpful and are often described as dysfunctional or maladaptive. And you'll hear me talk a little bit later about some of the issues I have with that and, and how we actually tell our patients that the way in which they think is somehow maladaptive or dysfunctional. I find that a little bit blaming. A, a lot of service users tell me that they, they find that difficult. And certainly in the approach I'll be talking about later, it's an approach that sees all thoughts and all behaviors and feelings as functional. They may not always be helpful, but to actually label them as maladaptive or dysfunctional perhaps isn't as useful as we, as we could be. But suddenly at the moment, NICE and the Scottish version, version of NICE, uh, these are our national guidelines, uh, and in psychosis, they suggest that CBT uh, should be offered on a one-to-one -one individual basis for a minimum of around 16 sessions. Okay, and again, I'll, I'll mention that later. So based on these current approaches, uh, I'm gonna give you some examples of things coming up at the moment, some new approaches, particularly out of Manchester. So there's a collaborative study going on between Manchester, London, and Glasgow uh, with many of my very close colleagues, Philippa Garrity, uh, Jill Haddock, Sandra Bucci, Andy Gumley, for example. They're looking to see whether they can build on some of Julian Leff's work using avatars, digital avatars, to represent things like auditory hallucinations and actually expose people to those and help them cope better with them. We've also got the CALMS trial. This is uh, led by Trish Gooding and, and Jill Haddock at Manchester, specifically focusing suicide prevention in psychosis. Uh, Catherine Berry and her team are, are doing the TULIPS trial, which is a big multi-center randomized cluster um, trial, looking to see whether if we can increase psychosocial interventions on inpatient units, whether we can reduce serious incidents of self-harm and, and violence and aggression, and also reduce the negative impact on staff. Then Filippo Varese, who also works in my team, he's doing a lot of trauma-focused work and some really exciting studies coming up there. One looking at um, trauma-focused CBT for psychosis, 
also EMDR, which is the, the tapping. And again, it's a much more attentional focused intervention uh, to work on trauma and psychosis. And Filippo's also looking at trauma therapy for those who haven't actually had an episode of psychosis yet, but are at very high risk of developing psychosis. And of course, you may well have heard of Act Assist and some of the digital health apps, the smartphone apps that are being developed. And Sandra Bucci, again at Manchester, a good friend of mine, is really developing some of those, particularly for psychosis, with a whole range of mindfulness-based interventions included in that. And that's looking very exciting. And again, um, Dawn Edge, she's been looking to see if they can adapt CBT interventions particularly for an African Caribbean population, because of course what we know is that cultural adaptations of CBT have not been uh, particularly advanced to date. And there's lots of work going on to see if we can make CBT more accessible for people um, of BAME uh, backgrounds so that they can also access this in a more convenient and helpful way. So lots of exciting things coming up um, and I know that many of these new developments are trying to focus on some of the challenges to date that we've had with traditional CBT approaches. So let's just look at what some of those limitations are then. Well, we've had lots of problems actually implementing CBT into routine clinical practice. So even though that we know that some of the results in controlled trials have been useful, it's been hard to actually make that happen on the ground. And there's all sorts of reasons for that, which I, I don't have time to go into in, in detail, but I've given some references there of some of the uh, difficulties with time that staff have and, and attitudes towards CBT and understanding. And I've already mentioned that to date, the effect sizes really have been small to moderate, which some people say, you know, that, that is a bit of a problem really in terms of uh, actually being able to offer treatments that only have just a small effect. But more than that, many service users who experience psychosis say that they find structured CBT interventions really difficult to engage with. You know, often people's lives are quite chaotic. They've got lots of socioeconomic disadvantage and, and difficulties. And also emotionally, it's very difficult to really be able to focus on things long enough because they're very painful for people to engage in, in CBT. And other people tell me they can find it quite um, hard work because you know, there's a lot of um, intellectual or rational thinking involved. And sometimes when you're very emotional, it's hard to be able to, to focus on those things. The actual reasons why CBT might work, so the mechanisms of change and the active ingredients are really poorly understood. And Alan Kasdan said a number of years ago that um, in all of the years we've been looking at CBT and other approaches, we're still behind on thinking about why these interventions actually have any benefit. There's just modest benefits over non-specific interventions, such as, you know, counselling or, or sort of client-centred support and, and befriending, again, which is a major problem. Some further challenges, which I'm, and the reason I'm going through this in more detail is these are some of the issues I'm hoping to address with a more principles-based approach. But the models that we've had for why they work really are quite hypothetical. You know, they're not functional models that we can test directly. The interventions are very problem specific. So they either focus specifically on delusions or, or voices uh, or negative symptoms, and what we're doing is coming up with lots of different approaches for different symptoms. And that's hard to train. It's also expensive. We need extensive assessments. And the other problem, of course, is that most of the people we work with in clinic, they don't just have one problem. They have multiple issues. And those don't just include lots of different psychotic experiences, but anxiety and depression and eating disorders and lots of the other issues we see across the board, they're all there in psychosis. I've already mentioned the lack of cultural adaptation. And I don't just mean in terms of different 
ethnic groups, but even culturally in terms of people's different frames of reference. Current CBT can often have problems with being able to, to meet the challenges of some of those. Lots of people with psychosis have cognitive difficulties. It's hard for them to remember and, and pay attention to things. And we also need to pay more attention to understanding people's experiences from their perspective and some of the positive or, or advantages that our service users tell us that their symptoms have. As I've already mentioned, the, the concept of maladaptive or dysfunctional thoughts it can be quite invalidating and, and blaming for lots of people. So I'm trying to find ways to sort of move away from that to work in ways that people can relate to more idiosyncratically. I've mentioned about structured therapy and, and frameworks often not being possible, particularly in acute mental health settings. So we're trying to find ways of working much more flexibly where somebody might come to a session, but then not want to come back for a few weeks. We need ways of having therapies that you know, follow the trajectory of the individual client rather than being too rigid and, and you know, it has to be an intervention that you do every week. Not always possible. People often talk about CBT in a dose response way as though the more you get of it, the better it will be. That's not supported in the evidence. What we find is people want therapy when they need it. And they often want it at different times and people need different amounts. And people like Barkham and, and Bill Stiles talk about the good enough level model where people need to come for therapy to get enough to make them feel okay rather than a one size fits all approach being what we need here. So implementation problems around all of this means that access to CBT to date really hasn't been very good. So again, uh, a principles-based approach, I hope will be much more flexible to be able to address some of these. So what might that principles-based approach look like? Well, I'm going to introduce perceptual control theory as an integ sorry, I'll get my words out, as an integrative framework of understanding everyday human behavior. And by integrative, I'm going to give you some evidence that this theory can really accommodate and offer a framework for understanding much of what already exists within the literature. It's a scientific theory that's been around for a long time, developed by a man called William T. Powers, who was a very dear friend to me and unfortunately passed away a number of years ago and is greatly missed. Uh, I often think, oh, I wish I could ring him up again and just ask him about something, but um, you know what wonderful work he did. And like I said, this theory has been around for a long time, but only more recently been applied to mental health issues in more detail by um, another colleague of mine, Tim Carey. And also um, I have to credit Warren Mansell for a lot of the work he's doing with our team as well at Manchester. So what I love about this theory is it's a theory that talks about how we all function rather than one of abnormality and psychopathology, which we're often quite used to hearing. Because this theory is a functional theory, so it actually talks specifically about the how behavior works in a way that can be modeled and simulated, it makes it amenable to direct testing. And goodness knows, Certainly from my uh, opinion, that is exactly what we need in psychology. Uh, theories that are applicable to real life situations and are directly amenable to testing, rather than being too hypothetical. So um, let's have a look at what the key principles of this theory are then. There are three, so not too much to remember. Three clear principles, control, and I'm going to explain uh, these in a bit more detail in a moment, but the first one is control. And I'm going to argue that this is what we all as living organisms do, and we have to be able to control certain uh, biological, social, and psychological variables in order to survive. The second principle is conflict. And I'll talk about that as the most common reason for why we often lose control. And reorganization. Psychological reorganization is what 
often happens in any effective therapy, but can also happen spontaneously for many people. And this is what restores control. And I'll come back to those in a moment. Let's look at control first of all. Now, Bill Powers said that all psychological difficulties, all distress and emotional problems can be understood as the consequence of a person experiencing reduced or loss of control. And uh, I'm going to show you a slide in a moment where there is evidence across the literature of this. But what am I meaning by control and, and why is it important? Uh, Tom Bourbon said, life is control. It's an uninterrupted process of specifying, creating and maintaining. It's a process in which all that is not essential is free to change and move about in order to prevent those things that we have to maintain within a given, uh, you, you know, within a given uh, degree of freedom of, of error has to stay constant. So one way of explaining this is a process that you're probably more familiar with and that's homeostasis. And essential biological, psychological and social variables here have to stay within a given range. So think of body temperature, for example. In order to survive, we have to have that within a given range. And our bodies automatically respond and do things to maintain that. Now, what Bill Powers said was that applies to behavior and all psychological variables as well, which I think is a new way of thinking about psychological functioning. Essentially what control is, it's making something happen in the way that we want. And we can call this the Goldilocks theory of life. You know, um, I find that a much easier way of remembering. Goldilocks, she went in and ransacked those poor bears house. Things were either too hot, too cold, or just right. Too hard, too soft, just right, and so on. I like to call these variables that we have to keep within a given range are just right states. And of course we have them all. You know, we all like things to be just so. And when they're not, we don't feel very happy. And it's exactly the same in any kind of psychological distress. When these just right states or goals or values, whatever language we use to describe them, when they're not within that given range, we become quite psychologically distressed and our functioning is compromised. So we perceive things. Our current experience is based on the way in which we perceive it to be. We compare that to our just right state. And if there's a discrepancy between the two, we have to act. We have to do something to bring the two in line. So we can understand behavior therefore as being the control of our experiences, which is a bit of a shift away from traditional ways of thinking. And certainly the way we think in traditional behavior or cognitive theories, which say basically that we control our output, our behavior. We can actually think about our goal and make our behavior the way we want it to be. Whereas what I'm saying here is actually behavior is a little bit more automated. It's a little bit out of our awareness. And what we are trying to focus and control is our current experience. And of course, we have multiple just right states or internal standards that we're trying to control at any one time. And when we get into difficulty is when these don't align, when they're incompatible. And I'll come back to that in a second. So let's think about any given current experience. What we're doing is, um, you know, trying to, to keep that within a given range, as I said, and they're organized in hierarchical principles. So if we go down the hierarchy, you know, so how we might control something, this relates to particular control processes, muscle movements, etc. If I were to pick up my phone, what I'm doing is controlling for the where my phone feels in relation to my ear. It's muscle movements when we go down the hierarchy. If we move up the hierarchy, so why I want an experience to be a particular way, 
I'm more likely to get to values and principles about myself, the world and other people. So why I need my phone there might be that I, I need somebody to hear me. I want to, to speak clearly. You know, why do I want to be speaking clearly? This will all go up to values about myself and others that are important. So control is essential and it's organized hierarchically in this way. Just to demonstrate how this is so relevant to psychosis, there are huge numbers of examples, and I've just selected a few here so that you know I'm not making it up. Um, there are huge examples of where control processes are so essential in psychosis. So Toni Morrison and Adrian Wells did a study where they looked at how being able to have a sense of control over our thinking is important in psychosis. Attentional control, loss of interpersonal control is often seen as a developmental factor in psychosis. Lack of control over life events is frequently a precursor to people developing psychosis as well as a consequence. And of course, being able to control our own lives is hugely important in recovery and also why people often become very distressed. Here are some specific control processes that have been identified as being essential within psychosis, many of which have been targeted in therapy and where they have been, it has been quite effective. So for example, um, compassionate mind training has become quite common uh, place and uh, popular within psychosis. This really is focusing more on self-attacking and this idea that people don't want to feel criticized and yet often engage in self-attacking as a functional way of trying to improve what they're doing, etc. So lots of evidence of these different control processes. Similarly, the link to being able to control important life goals was demonstrated in a study that I did with Filippo Varese when he was uh, training as a psychologist and, and I supervised his thesis. And what we did is we interviewed a whole number of people who heard voices, both people who heard voices and required help from services, as well as those who were non-clinical voice hearers. What we found was direct evidence of the theme of people's voices being directly related to their important life goals. So here, direct evidence of what I'm saying, that control of life goals is inherently where it's at in psychosis and, and what we need to focus on. We also did another study looking at the amount of distress and whether distress could be understood as the degree to which the content of those voices actually acted as a hindrance to people achieving their personal goals, as well as where those voices were helpful to people achieving their goals. And indeed, what we found here was evidence that um, voices do have quite a clear impact on people's personal goals and where they don't facilitate them, distress is at its highest. So lots of evidence to support some of the principles that I'm talking about here, particularly that control is something to focus on. And I see that as a key transdiagnostic process, although nowadays I like to refer to it as a, an a-diagnostic process, because many of the people that I work with, of course, don't want to have a diagnosis and don't see it as being something that's helpful to them or relevant to their problems. So control is where it's at, is my key message. And of course, what we're trying to control at any one time is often problematic because it doesn't fit with other things we're trying to control simultaneously. So thoughts, experiences, and feelings are only problematic relative to other coexisting thoughts, experiences, and feelings. My colleague, Tim Carey, who I work very closely on this with said, the value that we attribute to a particular thought is always determined by the way in which it measure, measures up to other thoughts, ideas, and goals, and beliefs that we have. So when they're not compatible, that's when people start to struggle. Here's an example from somebody that I worked with, somebody who did experience psychosis, but the thing that they wanted to work on 
was this image of an abuser that they had from their earlier life. You know, they'd experienced horrible trauma around abuse. And she said, I just need this image of this man to go out of my head. I can't cope with it anymore. I can't get on with my life. And I asked her, I said, you know, this might sound like a really stupid question, but what is it that bothers you about, you know, or does it even bother you that you can't get this intrusive image out of your head? And she said, well, yes, of course it bothers me that I can't get it out, but, but no as well. And, and then she looked really surprised. And on further questioning, she said, well, I need to remember this person so that I can start to blame him instead of blaming myself, which was an ongoing you know, issue for her and often acted as a trigger for some of her psychotic uh, experiences. But she said, I also want to forget him so that I can just be the person that I am and move on. And there you had it two incompatible needs for the same experience. And once she developed awareness of this for the first time, because she was only aware of the, the side that wanted to get rid of the images, when she became aware of the side that didn't and actually needed it, it was functional, that really normalized the experience. And we were then able to read around other people who have a similar thing. And then she realized that there needed to be some balance, some equilibrium for these two needs. And that led to our work on when was it appropriate to remember this more and think about the images? And when were times when maybe she needed to put it to the side and move on and get on with her life? And when she could work to a balance, that was far more beneficial rather than just trying to reduce the images and the thoughts. Not easy work, but much more successful for this particular individual who had a lot of therapy trying to reduce the intrusive images. Again, this slide just demonstrates that I'm not making it up when I talk about conflict, that there's huge amounts of evidence throughout the history of psychology and the research that's been done that conflict is very, very familiar and important to us within the literature right back to Freud, obviously, and I hope those of you who are more aligned with psychodynamic approaches find that uh, the principles that I'm talking about maybe make sense to some of the work that you're doing as well. And we see conflict inherent in lots of different approaches, especially some of the newer ones under the CBT umbrella, such as motivational interviewing and acceptance and commitment therapy, uh, self-attacking, compassionate mind approaches, where people talk about being in two minds about worry or um, self-attacking, really helpful. And here's another brief example of somebody who I worked with, just to illustrate what I'm talking about. This was uh, a man who heard voices, which were very distressing because they were the voices of his uh, brother who'd committed suicide, unfortunately. And he talked about um, this voice often saying in his brother's voice, that he hadn't done enough, that it was his fault, that he hadn't been a strong enough person. Now, of course, I could have worked in a traditional CBT way here, where we could have just focused on the voices and making them less distressing, trying to have time away from them, you know, manipulating how loud they are and, and even trying to get away, uh, make the voices go away. But this wouldn't have got to the heart of the problem for him which was very much connected to this goal, this value or this just right state of being a strong person. And this issue of being a strong person was always the trigger that came up. If he was in a social situation, feeling as though somehow he hadn't performed well enough, or if he'd felt as though other people um, had been a little bit threatening towards him. You know, he lived in quite a poor area and when he went out often, he felt quite anxious about other people around, you know, gangs and, and people like that, making him feel that he wasn't a strong person. That was the key theme for him. Not so much the voice. The voice was the consequence of how he felt. So when we really got to the heart of this and started talking about it, he had, now this is going down the hierarchy of how he went about being a strong person. He said, well, there were two things being manly, but also being kind. 
Now on the left hand side here, I've jotted down some of the observable behaviors that he identified that fitted with these two incompatible goals that he had. So being manly was about being assertive, stating your needs, which of course meant telling people what he wanted, being truthful, actually being honest with people, telling them what he thought, which might at times involve hurting someone's feelings. At the same time, he also said it was important for him to be kind. And that meant trying hard to please other people, doing the right thing, doing what others wanted him to do, telling a lie sometimes because you wouldn't want to say something too honest. And for him, that was losing integrity. So on a daily basis, he'd flip between the two. And the conflict that he felt, the distress from flitting between the two, but never quite achieving one or the other, was a common trigger for his voice. So what we were able to do in the work together was develop awareness of this. And for him to start to see in different situations where he might try and create some balance. This involved quite a lot of practical problem solving and thinking about his different goals in many different situations. That was the heart of our therapy really. So it was really focusing on the conflict. Now, why is conflict so important in psychosis? Well, solutions will be successful when you address both sides of it, as I've said. The solution will, will be unpredictable. It'll have to be novel. And therefore the time taken to arrive at the novel solution will vary from person to person. It's going to be a trial and error process. Logical problem solving won't always be of use. Giving advice could be very limited value because you may give advice in line with one side of the conflict, but not the other. Now we often talk about resistant clients, people who aren't ready or are maybe too unwell for therapy, which many staff tell me. I would argue that it's not really about the client. It's about us as the therapist. And maybe what we need to do is go back to the drawing board and operate a, a conflict-based formulation. Because these so-called resistant clients may be working from one side of the conflict and have little awareness of what else is important to them and what they need to focus on. So when therapy isn't really moving forward in the way that you want, a conflict formulation can be hugely beneficial. And it takes us, what we're trying to get our patients to do is reorganize. This is, reorganization is basically coming up with a solution that fits both sides of the conflict. Discrepancy between a just right state and a current experience causes random changes to our behavior in order to minimize the discrepancy. That random generation of behavior is an inherent learning process. We can't stop it. It's happening all of the time, incessantly. And it's the thing that actually helps us move forward and resolve problems. Now I say random, it's not truly random in a random sense. It's random within the constraints of what we know and what we're capable of doing based on our previous experiences in life. Okay, so random is always within the constraints of our own abilities and knowledge and our own experiences. So <clears throat> we do this to try and minimize discrepancy. It's a basic process. You know, this fits with chaos theory and, and what people like Alan Turing talked about. Simple rules, complex behavior. Okay, decision-making, planning, analysis of the pros and cons of behavior, it's not involved, which helps explain why often in psychosis, what you see is a sudden change in someone's behavior that works for them at some level, but is grossly problematic at another level, okay? And um, psychosis, I would argue, is always functional at some level. So reorganization basically consists of awareness and generating new changes and monitoring the change that that has on the person's environment in a trial and error way until you find a solution to how you're feeling, to fixing your just right state, even though it may have problems.
And I've already said, reorganization is unpredictable. It's not linear in a dose response way. It takes different amounts of time for different people. And the first solution won't always be the best one. Sometimes things have to get worse before they get better. And I warn the people that I work with about this, they need to know. They need to know that it's not always going to happen overnight and that there may be side effects. So control is really important. We're trying to help people understand and develop awareness of what they're controlling and explore where the conflicts lie so they can come up with new solutions and reorganize. How do we do this in therapy? Well, the method of levels is a direct application of perceptual control theory. And I have been applying this within psychosis. What we try and do is two simple things. There's all, you know, it, there's only two things to remember. Very easy, not so easy to do in practice, I have to be honest. <laughs> we encourage people to talk freely about a problem and pay attention to it and experience a range of background thoughts coming into their head. And we do this as therapists by asking questions. And we look for signs that maybe a background thought has popped into their head and we draw attention to that as well. Why? Why are we doing this? Well, we've spent years doing research, looking at a whole range of different therapies and what it is we think that is the common ingredient across all of those therapies I talked about at the start that have been applied to psychosis. We think that there are four key things that need to happen. The first one is a person needs to sustain their attention on a problem at hand, okay? In a way where they focus on that experience. And to do this, we often ask them to express that problem verbally because there is something very, very important about verbal or external expression of a problem. Saying something out loud is very different to repeating inside your head over and over, which essentially is ruminating, which never feels very good. And external expression doesn't always have to be verbal. It could be through art. It could be through music. It could be through other some modality, which is why I think those other therapies can be helpful. It's the external ex expression that's important. And we sustain people's attention on a problem long enough, externalizing it, long enough for them to get a connection to the emotion associated with it. Some felt sense of that problem so that they're able to shift perspective and look at this from different evaluative experiences. They're developing awareness of what's important to them how they currently go about trying to achieve those goals and where maybe they need to make some adjustments. That's what we're trying to achieve in therapy. Why are the background thoughts so important? Well, you're probably having a whole range of background thoughts right now as I'm talking. They may look like this. Those sort of thoughts may well have been going through your head, but for many of our patients, those thoughts tell us about what's going on in the background. They are things that our patients may not have paid any attention to, but know at some level. It's that just outside of awareness and they are where the insights can come from. Sometimes they're not always relevant. You know, it's like, what am I gonna have for dinner? in which case your role as a therapist is to keep them on track, focusing on the problem at hand. But we also want to capture those background thoughts because our patients have the answers. And that's exactly what Socrates said. He believed that everybody had the answer within them. And so do I, everybody has the capacity to get themselves better. But we as therapists need to create a safe enough environment for them to be able to explore that, to discover those answers. It's really about exposure to the problem at hand. And it's really about mobilizing awareness and attention so that they can discover other things that they would have only fleetingly paid attention to. 
So being therapeutic involves helping people become aware of new perspectives, to mobilize their awareness and attention, and direct it to parts that they wouldn't have done so otherwise, maybe because it's difficult. Now I'm going to show you a very brief demonstration of a therapy clip. Now this is a person, unfortunately, um, I had a clip of somebody who really was experiencing psychosis, but it ended up being such bad quality that I, I thought it was better not to use it. Um, this is the clip of my colleague, Tim Carey, working with a lady called Rachel, who agreed for me to be able to show this. Now she has a belief that she has a special gift. She's not psychotic. Um, she just has a very strong belief that she has this ability to read other people and communicate. And she describes it as a, a special power. And when she was talking in her native language in a different country, she could use this power to make people be her friend if she wanted, to do what she wanted to do. Then she moved to the UK and found because English wasn't her first language, she was unable to do this anymore and she became hugely distressed. Um, and this is her talking about this problem. Now the, the session that Tim did was only 20 minutes, too long to show today. So what I've done is I have edited it down so that you get a three and a half minute summary of this uh, clip. And you'll have to believe me that the insights that she showed um, came about all in that 20 minute session, which is quite unusual. Often people experience those in their own time at a later date, you know, outside of the session. But it gives you an example of how as a therapist we would ask questions and, um, you know, draw attention to those background thoughts. So here we go. Rachel, thanks for coming along. What would you like to talk about today? When I, when I find myself in any situation, new situation, or it doesn't matter where, mm -hmm. I know that I will, I will be able to deal with the situation with my communication skills. Mm -hmm. Like I always used to say, there's, if I want to be a friend of someone, there's no chance it won't happen because I always choose my friends and I know they will be my friends if I want. Is that right? Yeah. And you kind of even smile as you say that. Like... Yeah, because it, it sounds a little bit, controlling which is not it, it's not i just i just know it deep in my deep in my heart i know mm -hmm. it, this is all happening mm -hmm. maybe like for me commun interpersonal communication is kind of having control in a situation like feeling the env environment like like my eyes mm -hmm. i have my eyes and i know what's going on in the room i know what to expect mm -hmm. and how to deal with things yeah. so communication skills is kind of my eyes mm -hmm. And can you say a bit more about that? It is so amazing that I have these skills. Mm. It, it's wonderful. And I know it's very rare, like most people don't have it. Mm. If I will use it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And in, in, in well, where did you get to just then? What? Maybe it's not fair. It's not fair. Yeah, to have these skills. <clears throat> like why? Do I think that people have to be my friends? Why do I think? Well... Can you talk about what, what you're doing just now? Yeah, why well, I'm so sure about it. And that I do. Because I know this is true. Mm -hmm. And you're wondering why you are so sure about it? Yeah, it's, it's not fair. Like, it sounds like people are... I can't say vulnerable around me, but yeah, if I have a power that they don't have, mm -hmm. it's not fair. Mm. I know that it sounds a little bit selfish, which is not, which is not because I'm really, really try to use it in a, in a good way. Mm -hmm. I know it's kind of um, um, it's a skill that you have to know how to use it, and I know that in the past, I, I. I use it kind of in the wrong way sometimes. Mm -hmm. What do you think about it that? Sounds bad. <laughs> it's so bad. What, what was the badness there that you were? No, because how would I let people be themselves if it's on my condition? It's mm. not like letting them to be themselves. It is kind of a control. Mm. Gosh, I don't like it. <laughs> no. And is that what you're saying? You 
that's what the situation was when you had your skills. Yeah. That that it was on your conditions. Yeah. So people weren't really being who they were. I thought they were. Okay. So. Mm, what happened for you just then? I realized that I want to be able to live without the mm -hmm. skills. It's okay. I mean, I'm happy when I have it, but I want to be happy even when I don't have mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And to feel secure mm -hmm. even when I don't have it. Okay, so um, basically what you saw there was somebody who started off by saying very clearly that they had these skills and then as they started to explore it and get in touch with the background thoughts which provided new insights, suddenly she became aware of some of the problems with those abilities and, you know, it didn't fit with some other values. And then moving forward, she suddenly developed an aha moment of, actually, I need to learn to live without those. Now that client did that for herself. And what you will have seen from the therapist is him focusing very much on the here and now, only asking questions in the present moment, asking about what else was going on at the same time. Now here's where the method of levels only does that. It only focuses on current thinking. It only asks questions. And I am not saying that this is unique to the method of levels. In other therapies, you will see this happening, but they also include a whole lot of other more idiosyncratic things specific to that approach, which I'm arguing might not always be necessary. And what we could do is perhaps cut out a lot of those specific uh, model approach techniques and focus more on what we think might be at the heart of what works which is actually allowing more space for the client to tune into their own experiences in a way that is so in the present moment. It's very experiential. It's very much about noticing what's going on right now. Now this can move very fast for people, too fast for lots of people. So it's important that it's paced at a, um, you know, in a way that the client can cope with, that they have their foot on the brake and can stop it at any point. So I'm always regularly asking, are you okay to keep talking about this? Do you need to stop for a bit? So it's directed by the patient that we go at their pace and the content of the conversation is only led by the patient and not the therapist. So that it's culturally sensitive, it meets the need of the individual and we're not pushing people in a direction that might not be right for them. Here are some other examples. So this is somebody who said, if this glimmer of hope goes away, I'll just forget my needs and isolate myself. How sure are you of that right now? Now we wouldn't ask all of these questions in one go. We might just ask one, you know, and, and a simple question that doesn't take very long. So you're not pulling somebody out of the experiential um, moment. You know, their attention is very much in the moment. How does it sound to hear yourself say that out loud? How much hope would need to go? You know, and you'll hear me using my voice in a compassionate and sensitive way, conveying the idea to the patient, I am really interested in you. You know, I am, you're the most important person in the room right now. I can't know what you're going through. So I really want to understand. This is incredibly client-centered. What we also do, because control is at the heart of this, is encourage patients to book their own sessions when they want and have sessions for as long as they want, obviously within given parameters. You know, services have constraints, so, you know, we can say you can have a maximum number of sessions or a maximum length of time. But other than that, we allow people to, to have complete control. And what we find is that far from the expectations of many service managers, which is we'll be overrun with people, <laughs> that doesn't actually happen at all. Uh, some people want to come every week, some people don't. We can find other ways of managing risk with other members of the team, freeing the therapist up to be able to work with people when it suits them. And what that means is the person comes for therapy when they need to, when they want to, you reduce your, um, did not attend rates, uh, engagement is better, and it's worked much better. I've 
uh, done this in early intervention services when I was service lead there once. We had a two year waiting list and within six months I managed to eradicate that so people could access therapy immediately. Um, the agenda when we have a session, it's not just talking about nothing. We have a very clear focus that we ask the patient to define. Homework is not necessary as we give in CBT. And it's this processing of experiences that are live and online that are the key change techniques here. So, um, you know, what we've looked at is um, clients attending self scheduled therapy sessions, not just for method of levels, but in the literature, wherever this happens, those are the ones that tend to show significant reduction in symptoms of a medium to large effect size. I'm not just talking for psychosis, I'm talking across the board. So there are lots of potential advantages here. Uh, greater service, control, service user control and choice. Uh, like I said before, we can work across all different problems, not just specific diagnostic categories. Um, it improves trainability and implementation. It could be a more efficient use of resources, and I'll show you some evidence for that in a second. It targets core processes, immediate experiences to ensure flexibility. It doesn't require people to disclose things that they don't want to. If somebody wants to talk about an experience and I don't know, they might refer to it as wibbly wobbly or, or whatever they want. We can talk about wibbly wobbly without them having to go into detail if that's too painful. Um, and there's no advice or suggestions that I'm giving. I'm helping the client figure it out for themselves. So we've done some evidence-based work trying to um, establish efficacy for this. Uh, a study that I did with Tim Carey a number of years ago in Australia, we offered method of levels um, to people over a two year period in a secondary care service. And um, this included a lot of people with psychosis or who were inpatients. There were 51 men, 41 females. Uh, average, um, sorry, median range, uh, age of 37. And uh, they engaged in patient-led scheduling over the two-year period. So they only came when they wanted to. And what we found when we did uh, benchmarking against other similar trials, these other trials of things like CBT, we found that the reliable uh, um, change, this is using Jacobson's reliable change index. Um, we had just as good reliable uh, change, but when we looked at the efficiency of this approach, so this was dividing the number of sessions by the um, effect size, what you'll see compared to other studies, our effect sizes are at least as good as but our efficiency ratio down the bottom here is much better than other studios, studies. This has lots of methodological flaws. This is preliminary evidence, but there is promise here that this patient-led scheduling could potentially increase the efficiency of what we're doing. So we create the same effect, but in far less time. We've also offered method of levels to people with first episode psychosis in services. Again, they scheduled their own appointments. Uh, this was just a feasibility study. So it was not powered to say whether MOL is more effective or efficacious. But what we did find is that um, it was extremely acceptable to people. It was feasible to run in this service. And there was promising results in terms of um, people actually finding this really useful. We interviewed people as well, and um, what we found was, oh, sorry, I've, I've just summarized that, that uh, lots of people attended. Um, the, compared to treatment as usual, it looked very promising. Uh, the mean number of sessions that people attended was around four, which fits with some of the literature on sudden change in, in CBT. And um, what we found is that attendance was really, really good it was two participants that accounted for 59% of the cancelled appointments, which meant that our attendance rates here were amazing, far better than uh, for most other uh, therapies in trials. And our qualitative results showed that um, what people said, so that the core 
the four key themes here was it was the therapist's approach that was important because of the way in which it helped people to talk and think more deeply. Thinking and talking was really important to be able to look at their problems from a different perspective and being in control was absolutely pivotal as well for people. This is what our service users told us. This fits with the key principles that we were talking about as well in terms of how we think that method of levels works. We've also um, looked at working with people in in inpatient settings and this involved predominantly people with psychosis and we, we published a study that um, showed that it was very feasible and acceptable to people. I also spent two years working on an inpatient unit offering this approach uh, because it utilized our resource in the best way possible. I would see everybody who came through our doors just to tell them about this. I would then put up the appointment sessions that I was available for that week, allowing people the freedom to book in as and when they wanted. What this meant was that at least 75% of people who came into our inpatient unit utilized at least one session. That's almost unheard of in inpatient settings for people who access psychology. More than 50% had more than one session. The sessions, the number that they had ranged from one to 18. So what it meant that many of them were spur of the moment sessions when people were in crisis. Staff would often call me down, especially in the evenings when something was going on on the ward. So I could use this approach to work with people um, I don't have data for this, but what it did demonstrate to me was people could access this. People said it was useful in their satisfaction scores. They, um, they said that this was helpful. And, um, you know, it, it absolutely was um, something that was feasible to use in services like this. Uh, so we got a lot of positive verbal feedback and, and high satisfaction. So really promising. Um, and it really helped in terms of my own sense of what was acceptable within the multidisciplinary team uh, approach. And finally, um, some of the other studies that I'm doing at the moment, we're looking to do more case series of method of levels for psychosis in community mental health team settings. Um, we have already found that um, on average, People attend around eight sessions in that setting. Um, analysis of reliable and clinically significant change has indicated that five out of the six people that we looked at made uh, improvement, reliable change. And there was little evidence though of change on the psychotic measures, interestingly, but there was change on the outcome rating scale, which looks more at social functioning, relationships, um, you know, things that are more important to people rather than just their psychotic symptoms. Now, the reason this is so important is that many people are telling us they don't necessarily want their symptoms to change. They want their, the things in their lives to change, like their relationships. So what these preliminary studies are showing um, is that method of levels targets that and has the potential to make changes on that, even if the psychosis then doesn't change hugely itself. And we're, we're, we're also looking at develop, gosh, I, I will get my words out, <laughs> de delivering this therapy uh, online. So we're doing a study at the moment, uh, delivering therapy for psychosis online, and also helping people talk about their ambivalence about neuroleptics, which is quite common. Uh, we, we don't try and change people's mind. We just allow them the space to talk about medication Bizarrely, we find that it seems to show though it, as though it might actually increase medication uh, adherence, even though we're not directly attempting to do that. So in summary then, these existing approaches have small to moderate effect sizes for psychosis and may have some implementation and access problems, whereas a principles-based framework provides a good integrative approach for psychosis, method of levels shows some potential for addressing some of the challenges uh, other approaches have. Uh, service user appointment schedule seems to have a number of benefits. Um, so I think that should be looked at more. And the developing evidence for method of levels 
is that it's certainly acceptable, it's feasible, and does have some promise of benefit. But of course, we need to do a lot more research to be able to, um, to show this. And that was pretty much what I wanted to talk about with you today. So any questions I would be delighted to take. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you, Mike, and also the organizers of the conference. Thank you very much for a stunning presentation, Sarah. Thank you. Um, uh, we're, we're very well over time. So uh, um, if it's all right with you, Anna, I'll just uh, allow for a, a few minutes of uh, questions. Sure, sure. Um, okay. So um, do we have any, any questions? Yes, I'd like to ask something to Sarah very briefly. Hello, Sarah. Uh, we don't know each other, but uh, I'm, um, Clara Perkana, co chairing this event, Mike Wang. Um, I'm a psychoanalyst myself, so I don't know. I don't work very much with psychotic, patient, psychotic patients. And, um, but I was wondering, it was fascinating. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't thank you for your presentation, which was really fascinating. And I was kept me wondering if. Um, that method of yours is so much about control and awareness and the present. Is it not worthwhile to research a bit more into mindfulness? I think you said in the beginning that uh, you didn't have, have you didn't have um, much um, data on that, but um, you think it's worthwhile because mindfulness is also about that, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, I don't know if your patients are able to focus at all, but uh, well, it may depend. Thank you, and thank you for our lecture. It was wonderful. Thank you very much. I totally agree. Mindfulness, um, I think, is very important because really what we're talking about there is mobilizing somebody's awareness or attention in a way where they have it under their control. Now, I think a lot of mindfulness approaches, uh, and I'm not talking about all of them, but some of them talk about um, control in a way as though it's almost a skill to be learned. And people often either get it or they don't. Whereas, um, you know, uh, some people, if they don't achieve success at that immediately, feel as though they failed. So mm -hmm. I agree in the method of levels, there's a lot of overlap with what we're doing in mindfulness, but in a way where it's paced in relation to the client and not taught to them in a way where it's some skill that if they don't automatically get the hang of, they feel as though they've had a failure experience. But I also sometimes think maybe rather than being mindful, which is having our minds full of things that are difficult, maybe a bit of mindlessness is what we all need from time to time. And being able to learn how to control things, to be able to put it out of our heads as well, as much as we put it in our heads, being able to control doing both. So. Yeah, yeah. That's Well, the, the word is very unfortunate, the word mindfulness. Yeah. Because it has not to with that, but uh, it has to do with focusing and yes. the, not not being over, overwhelmed by thoughts. So the, the word is very, it was very poorly chosen in English, but uh, well, you know what I mean. Absolutely. So. And I, I think we're on the same page there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Clara. Um, any other questions? Perhaps I could just mention Sarah, um, and I have to say, <clears throat> your your talk brought back memories of, of being in Manchester myself, because <clears throat> I was um, a um, I, I did all all of my training, including being an undergraduate in Manchester, and and I very much remember uh, my old professor at that time, Jim Reason. Uh, talking about um, Miller, Galanter and Prebram's test operate, test exit. Um, well, it was originally a, a, ch a book and a chapter in that book, um, which um, uh, I know that Jim was very influenced by and thought that uh, it's an old book and, and it's an American uh, publication. And for him, it really marked the beginning of the cognitive revolution and the move away from behave, pure behaviorism of the J.B. Watson variety. Um, 
so I just I just wondered whether you <coughs> agreed with me that the uh, the, the the PCT um, um, approach, the perceptual control theory, um, actually seems to have its roots in Miller, Galanter, and Prebram. Well, I <laughs> I'm not so sure about that because. Um, the uh, perceptual control theory talks about behavior as being just what we use to control our input, whereas the research that you're referring to, I think, was very much about controlling our output, um, our behavior itself. So from this approach, I'd say people aren't really paying attention to their behavior. They're paying attention to their experiences. Mm. So in a way, PCT helps to explain behaviorism, but really from a different point of view to what people like Skinner would have said. And I'd love to know um, what Skinner would, would have said if he'd heard what uh, <laughs> some of the points I was making today. But yes, lots of overlap. Any other questions for Sarah? No, well then, um, it just falls to me to say 